just wanted to start by uh, thanking all the organizers for inviting us over here. This is the third year that uh, uh, my organization, the British Columbia Institute of Technology, is attending the uh, indo year Symposi Symposium on, on, on Methodology of Research in ISM. And we appreciate the fact that we've been invited uh, year after year. And for many of you who don't know, Canada is uh, Canada, US, and Mexico comprise of the North American continent. We are the landmass above the US. Um, many people don't realize that uh, Canada is the third largest uh, country in the world land-wise, but it, is, uh, it has a population of only about 30 million people, 33 million people. I was told that Bangalore has a population of about 8 million, so Bangalore has one quarter of Canada's population. It's an interesting perspective. And uh, if you look at uh, Canada, um, all our, the drug, dietary supplements, food is is um, regulated by the government body called Health Canada. So a lot of what I'll be talking about will also include uh, information from that is published by Health Canada. And uh, um, like the different states that India has, Canada has provinces, and uh, the BCIT, my organization, is based in the westernmost province of British Columbia. Um, and we're also the closest province to Asia, so we are considered the gateway province. Um, and hence, there's a lot of uh, interest uh, for BC, for British Columbia, with uh, TCM and ISM, which is the traditional Chinese medicine and the uh, Indian systems of medicine. And historically, we've had a lot of uh, uh, collaboration research-wise, going back and forth between Asia and Canada through BC. And uh, if you look at my topic, I basically have uh, two parts. One is uh, assessing the uh, Canadian NHP marketplace, and the second is providing the practical value that uh, uh, clinical trials have, uh, which is, is there an ROI on doing clinical trials? Let me first start by talking a little bit about uh, what are NHPs, um, and then go into uh, what is the marketplace for NHPs within Canada, and maybe within North America itself. Uh, NHPs or natural health products, Canada classifies, you know, we had uh, Dr. Khan who spoke yesterday about how um, the U.S. categorizes uh, dietary supplements and food and drugs. Uh, in Canada, we, we, we call them natural health products. It's a subset of drugs that are exempt. Uh, it's, a, it's a subset of drugs, but for most part are exempt from uh, the provisions of what uh, food and uh, drug regulations are. They are regulated by a directorate within Health Canada, which is called the uh, NHPD, Natural Health Products Directorate. Um, and uh, most of our regulations are fairly recent, as in of since January 2004. And if you see the mission of Health Canada, it says to uh, help the people of Canada to maintain and improve their health while respecting individual choice and circumstances. So personal choice is a, a very important part of, uh, of the Canadian society, but at the same time, within NHPD, you see that the role is to ensure that Canadians have ready access to natural health products that are safe, effective, and of high quality. So the safety aspect of uh, these products are also very important. And it's something that the government has taken upon itself as a regulatory body, which you'll see. I'll have a slide later on that shows how this is a little bit different from our southern neighbors in the US. Again, NHPs have... Uh, you know, like, how do you define them? There is a structure component and function component. Again, a lot of these slides you might have seen before in my colleague Hazra Muthu's presentation. Uh, the information is very similar. Um, the structure component, it could be a plant material, algae, bacterium, and it could be an extract or an isolate. It could include vitamins, amino acids, fatty acids. It could be a synthetic duplicate of the above. It could also be a mineral or a probiotic. All these are I mean, all these could be natural health products, class natural health products. It also has a function component, a substance. Um, it could be a homeopathic medicine or a traditional medicine that is manufactured and sold and represented for use in the diagnosis, treatment, mitigation, or prevention of a disease. It could also be used for restoring and correcting organic functions or for maintaining and just promoting health on a daily -day basis. So all these are also classified, uh, could be the broader definition of natural health products according Again, you'll see a lot of what I speak about would, will be the Canadian perspective, uh, because that's the, uh, that's the only perspective that I can, I, I can speak about. And uh, if, you, if you look at it, 
within from from an industry standpoint there are usually two drivers that are very important uh, in the one is the market pace uh, push that is a demand that you get from the marketplace and the other one is the pull that you have from the regulatory bodies the uh, uh, so from the regulatory compliance perspective you see nhps in canada are, ex are required to undergo pre market assessment to es establish the safety quality and efficacy yesterday we had a discussion in terms of what happens if a product already has a history of use? Um, Canada also respects that. So if a product has a history of use of over 50 years, then uh, safety and efficacy data are not required. If approved, um, I mean, once the, uh, the product license application sign is applied, and if approved, the applicant will be issued a product license, which is an NPN number that allows you to um, sell a product in the market. All manufacturers. Packages, laborers, and importers of NHPs must hold a site license. That's another requirement from the government, and uh, they're also re required to make, to uh, ensure that all the the set out the government set out GMP standards are being met. Now, what you'll see that there is also a subtle difference between uh, between US and Canada how we look at NHPs. Um, if uh, you see in the US, uh, it's classified more as a food or a dietary supplement. The focus is more on freedom of choice and on free market trade, whereas in Canada, the overriding value system is safety over freedom of choice. You'll see that uh, self-medicating is reasonable in the US, whereas medication is supervised by health professionals, which is uh, within the Health Canada and the NHPD directorate. Uh, regulatory focus in the US is on labeling and communication, whereas in, the, in Canada, it's more on safety, efficacy, and quality. Uh, the government's responsibility is is to prove that the products are unsafe, whereas in Canada the manufacturer is responsible for for proving safety. So, which means for you to be able to get your NPN, a pre-market uh, assessment needs to be done, and those uh, studies need to be submitted before your NPN number is even provided. Now, um, just to, wanted to share the next couple of slides, a little bit about what the market size and. Uh, um, what the marketplace for NHPs in Canada is. Um, one of the primary drivers, if you see, for the Canadian marketplace is the fact that Canada has a, uh, a not only Canada, but the entire North American continent has an aging population, um, uh, what we call as the baby boomers. So um, uh, there is also, uh, the other driver is healthcare costs. You know, there's also a lot of focus, the movement towards, you know, like self-care, like some of our, uh, my previous panelists and speakers spoke about. Um, also, the access to information has become very, uh, very common now. If you look at uh, one, one of the slides, I'll probably share some of the market data. You see there's a lot of um, movement of products into the market through the online community, more than through the uh, standard retail uh, distribution channels. And also the fact that there is an increased global trade. You know, there's uh, so much sharing of information now between um, you know, Asia and uh, North America that but these are some of the co where people are becoming more knowledgeable about alternate systems in medicine. So these are some of the drivers of what's driving uh, the Canadian marketplace for NHPs. Um, there's the the other aspect is that there is while there's a growing demand, while there is a growing uh, awareness and an interest for NHPs in Canada, there's also uh, a growing concern. You know, like 46% of Canadians believe that a lot of claims made by manufacturers, these are the products that are being sold in Canada. Um, are unproven, and um, so product quality remains a serious concern for uh, both consumers and clinicians, which is why uh, bringing these products into the mainstream within the North American market is still uh, a responsibility. It's also an opportunity for a lot of companies. Just some numbers, 71% of Canadian population report regular use of NHPs. Um, and again, uh, a good point that I had with one of my colleagues just before, during the tea break, was uh, uh, unlike uh, what happens in India, the Canadian consumer in of NHPs is a very disciplined user. So if there is a product, he would use it consistently over and over and over again. They're very disciplined in terms of what they use, which is why things such as safety and efficacy are very, very important to them. Uh, issues such as heavy metals that we've seen spoken about a lot are very prominent because they are very disciplined with what they use and they believe what uh, is reported through, of course, standard uh, revenues. BC, which is uh, the province that I come from, or uh, where BCIT is, uh, 
has the highest uh, usage of NHPs than any other things. And in 2007, NHPs were introduced into Canada's official food uh, guide, which is published by Health Canada. So what this says is that there is a growing demand. Sir, can you conclude in two minutes? In two minutes? Okay. I'm just going to quickly run through because uh, um, if you look at the Canadian, uh, these are some of the numbers. This talks about uh, uh, the Canadian marketplace. The other important point is there are a lot of big players uh, in terms of companies who are already manufacturing and selling brands. This also is an opportunity for a lot of Indian companies because there is an increasing demand. I uh, just wanted to share this slide with you. It just shows that the number of product licenses that have been issued has been growing. And keep in mind that these regulations only came in January 2004. So since January 2004, to uh, December of 2008, this is from the NHPD quarterly report, you see that there's a steady increase in number of uh, product license applications that have been coming out. Um, as you see, there are about over 50, 54,000 uh, product license applications that have gone on since um, it's, uh, the initiation of these regulations, regulations in January 2004. Um, okay. okay, and again, this is, and now I'm just going to shift gears a little bit in terms of what is the value in doing clinical trials, right? If you look at these from the uh, product applications between uh, April 2008 and uh, September of this year, uh, most of the claims that have, that have been applied for are under what we call as the non-traditional claims. So these are claims for formulations uh, which is different from what it was traditionally intended for. And I'll just take an example, and I'll use a case study over here of uh, ginseng. Ginseng traditionally has been used as an energy. Am I uh, louder now? Yes. Okay, okay. Um, I, I hope all that I said so far was not just a blur. Okay, okay. Well, I'll just give a case study of uh, ginseng. Ginseng, as we know, traditionally has been used for, uh, as an energy supplement in Canada. If you look at uh, the ginseng's traditional um, usage, it's about 3.3 million dollars in sales. We have claims on the product such as prevention for relief from cold, uh, prevention and relief from colds and flu. Now, see, prevention is a very strong word to use to be used on, on a label in Canada. So, you need to have clinical trials um, to be conducted to be able to use that. Plus, uh, relief from cold prevention and relief from cold and flu is not a traditional claim for ginseng. Now, what? Uh, this company did was one was they uh, rebranded it as cold effects they did uh, specific um, efficacy studies for that particular condition the um, the other thing was uh, they supported their claims through clinical studies and they also linked it with a brand they've got uh, Don Cherry I don't know many if any of you know the sport of ice hockey ice hockey is a very big game in Canada and Don Cherry is uh, is a sport icon in Canada so they had Don Cherry as a brand ambassador for the product so it added more testimonies to this. And uh, since this, you see that the, uh, if you look at the market value for ginseng now, which is the traditional use plus the use of ginseng for uh, uh, prevention and treatment of cold and flu, it moved up from just 3.3 million for the traditional use to 48 million, which is traditional plus non-traditional use. So this is just an example of how uh, you know, your uh, clinical studies could be useful for making claims that are non, uh, that have not been traditionally used before. And which is also reflective in terms of the number of uh, product license applications that we've been receiving, um, which basically are more for non-traditional claims than for traditional claims. I guess with that, I'm just going to conclude. I want to acknowledge the, uh, the organizers I want to, uh, of the Indo-US Symposium for inviting us. Also want to acknowledge Dr. Klaas Khan for uh, uh, having the Canadian counterparts always with the American counterparts and uh, the organizing committee. And if you have any uh, further questions, I'll be happy to answer them uh, during the Q&A session or during the lunch as well. Thank you.